Hi. In this lecture, I want to talk about relativism, which is the theory that there is no universal ethical code. The question that we have to ask is, are values simply a matter of opinion that are valid relative to some frame of reference, or are they objective by any definition? So relativists deny that there is a universal code that applies to everyone. They will say that there are ethical values, but they exist only relative to something else. So we might think of the taste of ice cream. We have chocolate lovers, we have vanilla lovers. There is an expression, there's no disputing over matters of taste. The chocolate lover is no better or worse than the vanilla lover and vice versa. And there's also really no arguing over this issue. You either love chocolate or you don't. You either prefer chocolate to vanilla or vanilla to chocolate. In the same way, then, the relativist will say that ethics is kind of like a matter of taste that's only valid relative to a certain frame of reference. Now, by contrast, an objective claim would be something that would be true independently of us. In this cartoon, we have one person who says there are four objects, the other person says there are three, and you can probably figure out which one is closer to the truth. The relativist will say that we can't do this in the case of ethics. Whatever truth there is to morality will only exist relative to something else. So what might that something else be? Well, there are three candidates for this. One is what's called individual relativism, also subjectivism. And that will say that each individual has his or her own morality. I might think that uh, capital punishment is right. You might think that it is wrong. And we're both right relative to our own perspective. Then we also have relativism by group membership. The group relativist will say each cultural group has its own morality. So the Taliban in Afghanistan might have their own morality. People in Scotland might have their own morality. People in Canada or people in the United States might have their own morality. And of course, in all these cases, it's not the case that one morality is better or worse than the other. They're just different. And finally, we have historical relativism, which works by saying that values are relative to some historical frame of reference. So we might say, in a particular culture like the United States, at one point in time, slavery was legal. At another point in time, slavery was not legal. The historical relativist will say, these views are different, but it's not that slavery is objectively better or worse than freedom would be, according to the historical relativist. Now, you might ask, why would anybody be a relativist? There are three main candidates for this. We have the diversity argument, the tolerance argument, and the dependency argument. So let's look at these. The diversity argument says if people disagree over what is right or wrong, there mustn't be a correct answer to the question, what is right or wrong? Premise two says people disagree over what's right or wrong, therefore there must be no correct answer to the question, what is right or wrong? Now this kind of argument is airtight as long as we accept both of the premises. It seems as though premise two is pretty well established by social science, in particular anthropology, because it is factually correct that we see people disagreeing over matters of ethics. But is this really a good argument? Well, not really. Consider this argument, which has basically the same form, but it's slightly different. Here we have premise one, if people disagree over the shape of the earth, there must be no correct answer to the question, what's the shape of the earth? The conclusion, therefore, would be there is no shape of the earth, or there is no correct answer to that question. Now, this might seem uh, an odd move to make, but consider the kind of reasoning we use here in the case of the shapeless earth is the same kind of reasoning that we used in the case of the diversity argument. Simply because there's a disagreement over what the answer might be doesn't automatically mean that the answer is relative and not objective. So the diversity argument is really a poor argument, poor justification for relativism. What about the tolerance argument? The tolerance argument says if no values are better than others, it's wrong to impose our own values on other people. Premise 2 says no values are better than others, with the conclusion it is wrong to impose our values on others. So 
The thinking behind this is that if we impose our values on other people, we're somehow being intolerant, right? We might say it would be wrong to judge other people. It would be wrong to expect other people to adopt our moral beliefs. Therefore, it would be wrong for us to try to impose our values on those people. But wait a second, though. If, if that's the case, if it really is the case that premise two is correct, then why couldn't I choose to be intolerant? It's not that tolerance is a better value than intolerance is, because all values are just relative. So you think of cases from history, some of the most intolerant people, like people in Nazi Germany, as an example. Um, if values are all relative, then no matter how intolerant somebody is, or no matter how tolerant they are, they're just as good or bad as the next person might be. So again, this argument really doesn't work that well. And then we have the dependency argument. Premise one to this says moral values depend on culture. Premise two, whatever depends on culture is relative to that culture, and the conclusion is moral values are relative to a culture. Now, the first thing to notice about this argument is there's something intuitively plausible to it, because when we think of moral values, or I suppose any value, like an aesthetic value, like beauty, we wouldn't necessarily say that we find these things just existing outside in the world. It's not that we find moral values in a scientific lab, or we find them next to a black hole. Wherever moral values are, they seem to crop up where people exist, and people exist inside cultures. So there seems to be something plausible about this, but we have to ask, what's meant by dependence? What does it mean to say something depends on something else? Well, we could mean two things. One thing is what's called strong dependency. And strong dependency says X depends on Y in the sense that X couldn't exist if Y didn't exist. So table manners could not exist without a culture that had tables or had, you know, shared dining uh, conventions. Game rules, like the rules of chess, could not exist unless people had invented chess. Holidays couldn't exist without calendars, without, you know, maybe days of the week. Without those things, we couldn't have Christmas or Hanukkah or your birthday or, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day. Then we have weak dependency, where X is conditioned, shaped, or influenced by Y, but would exist without Y. Good candidate for this would be Roman numerals or indeed any kind of number system. Uh, without Roman culture, Roman numerals never would have existed. But that doesn't mean that mathematics, which could be done with Roman numerals, only exists because the Romans existed. Or that calculus can only exist because, you know, of certain symbols that we've happened to create for calculus. If anything, we want to say math is something that's objectively real and, and is always true and we find it somehow in the world, so to speak. But the symbol systems we use, whether we, you know, use Roman numerals, whether we use other types of numeric uh, signifiers, symbols, those things are dependent directly on a culture. But math itself does not, is not. Again, food and water are universally required, but what you and I might happen to prefer to eat or drink, whether we prefer caviar to, you know, cheeseburgers, whether we like gorgonzola cheese to American cheese, whether we like red California wine to, you know, French wine, these things are, of course, dependent upon a culture. Now, what weak dependency seems to do is it opens up uh, the possibility that there could be the same value across cultures, but they just happen to get expressed in different ways in those cultures. So on the surface, they appear to be very different, but underneath it, these are just different cultural expressions of the same value. For example, every culture has some kind of incest taboo, some taboo against or concerning sexual relations with close relatives. But how do we define a close relative? For example, would a cousin count? Would a second cousin count? These relationships might be defined differently in different cultures, but each culture is uh, trying to understand how best to navigate things like 
incest and sexuality and reproduction. So the same value is at play there, but they're expressed differently. Again, think about water consumption. If you live in California where there's a virtual perpetual drought, what counts as excessive water consumption will be very different than it might be in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. It's not that using a lot of water in California excessively is right just because you think it's right. There is an objective fact about the matter. And in this case, whether you're in California or you're in, you know, monsoon season India where there's plenty of water, in all of these cases, people across the globe recognize that things like water are a precious resource. They just happen to define excessiveness differently because their circumstances are different. Or the value of honesty, or at least not lying. That may be universal, but how that value is expressed will vary. Uh, you know, for example, we may, in certain cultures, uh, recognize that we should be honest with our, with our elders, uh, and with our friends, but maybe not with, for example, our employers or not with the government. Uh, in other cultures, maybe this is defined in a, in a different kind of way. But the, the key value that all cultures require, no matter how they define it, is something like honesty or truth-telling. Or think of life as a universal value. It is true, different cultures will place a different value on different types of lives, but they do value life. For example, you know, you and I might place a higher value on our own children than we do on, the, on strangers. If we lived in a tribal community where we were very close-knit, maybe that distinction between our children and other people's children would be understood differently. The key idea is that life as a value would be of fundamental importance. Now, this suggests that simply because a value is not absolutely the same, without exception, in every circumstance, that it doesn't mean that there's no objective basis for it. The values would be the same, but they would be expressed differently in different situations. Now, in the next short lecture, I want to cover a couple other main criticisms of moral relativism.